2022 was a dire year for the global economy. The early optimism for post-COVID growth was shattered by Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine, in turn driving up food and energy prices worldwide. Dependent on Russia for gas and oil, Europe was especially hard hit. China's strict zero-COVID policies or factories and ports shut down, another disruption to global supply chains, hurting the rest of the world. Yet more interest rate rises were pushed through by the Fed and ECB, swerving to avoid an economic crash. So what does 2023 hold? The IMF says the Eurozone could narrowly avoid a recession, but not all economists agree. The rise of AI could call millions of jobs into question. Alongside the conflict in Ukraine, China's tension with Taiwan appears to be growing. India will overtake China to become the world's most populous country. This new year could see more economic upheaval than the last. I'm Ben Fazulan. Let's delve deeper into the divide in opinion over where the global economy is headed with star economist Nouriel Roubini. You write in your latest book that the world is stuck in crisis mode. You talk about mega threats, everything from war to climate change and inflation. And you reckon Europe is headed for a deep, protracted recession. Official forecasts are more optimistic. Why are you so pessimistic? Well, in the case of uh, Europe and the Eurozone, uh, the consensus is there'll be a short and shallow recession, maybe a couple of quarters starting with uh, the fourth quarter into the first uh, part of next year, followed by a recovery. I think that uh, the energy problems of Europe are severe. There are very high debt ratios. Inflation is going to be more persistent than what the European Central Bank expects. They'll have to raise rates more than the markets are expecting. And with a high loads of private and public debt that increase in interest rates is going to lead to a more severe economic contraction and may also lead to financial instability for the borrowing cost, both of the public sectors and the private sectors in the Eurozone. So I'm more pessimistic than the consensus about the degree and the severity of the economic contraction that the Eurozone is going to face uh, next year. How much longer do you think uh, a recession could last for Europe? Well, the consensus is that the recession might last only a couple of quarters, what they call a short and shallow recession, plain vanilla garden variety with barely any increase in the unemployment rate. Uh, I think that the recession might continue for most of next year, all of the four quarter of next year, as opposed to just a couple of quarters, based on the arguments that uh, the high debt ratios, there's still negative supply shocks, there's the significant price of energy still high, the dependence of Europe on energy. And I think that the conflict between uh, Russia and Ukraine, unfortunately, is going to get worse before it's going to stabilize. So there are also geopolitical factors that are going to affect negatively business, consumer and investors' confidence. A lot of those things we can't really do much about as consumers or businesses. Uh, is there anything we can do, though, to help soften the blow or, or even avoid such a long recession? Well, the policy response of the fiscal authority in Europe has been to essentially try to dampen the impact of the rise of energy prices, both on consumers that are households and on businesses, and uh, try to transfer money to those that are negatively affected. The trouble with that is you artificially reduce the price of energy when you should let energy to be at market rate so that there is a faster transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. You're not doing it if you are capping the price increases, and by transferring a lot of money to households and businesses, you give them purchasing power that keeps demand high, and it feeds the inflation expectation and the inflation rate. So the European Central Bank, on one hand, is tightening monetary policy to slow down growth, create slack that reduces the wage and price inflation, but the fiscal response that is to try to help the private sector does the opposite and feeds inflation over time. So there is an inconsistency between monetary and fiscal policy. What about a quicker shift to renewable energy? You uh, brought that up just then. Uh, wouldn't that be something that would 
uh, help spur on growth in, in that sector at least and perhaps solve some of our problems when it comes to climate change and energy insecurity? Well, it's easier said than done. You know, for the last year, the share of renewable in global energy has gone from about 8 to 12 percent, while the one of fossil fuel has been falling from 82 towards 78 percent. There is investment done in uh, renewable, but there are all sorts of bottlenecks. By the way, a lot of the green metals are needed to essentially produce uh, clean energy, whether it's copper, lithium, cobalt, or others, are now subject to what's called green inflation because they use a lot of energy. And with the price of energy being high, then the ability of producing those types of renewable energy is also constrained. And if you want a faster transition to renewables, you have to sharply increase carbon taxes. The average carbon tax to achieve the Paris Accord uh, goals should be $200 per ton. Today, the average uh, around the world is only $10. And politically, there is no country that's going to go from $10 to $200. If anything, the political response to high fuel prices is to reduce carbon taxes, to reduce fuel taxes that reduces the incentive to switch from fossil fuels to renewable. So you need to give price and market incentives. That's not happening fast enough. Now, another of the mega threats we've all had to deal with is the pandemic, which is said to be over, according to German virologists, as far as Europe's biggest economy goes. Surely that's going to make a massive difference sometime soon. Well, we don't know yet whether there'll be new strands uh, of uh, COVID-19 that will become virulent the way Omicron was. But the reality is that uh, global pandemics are going to become more recurrent and more severe. Think of it this way. Uh, we did have a pandemic in, uh, with the Spanish flu in 1918, and we didn't have any until the early 1980s. And since the early 80s, we've had HIV, SARS, MERS, Zika, Ebola, swine flu, bird flu, COVID-19, monkeypox. Why that's the case, it has to do with global climate change. As we destroy the ecosystem of animals and we encroach on them, then those animals that have pathogens like pangolin, bats and others are closer to livestock and closer to human beings. That's why you have this zoonotic transmission from animal to humans. That phenomenon is going to become more severe. And as there is global climate change, the permafrost, for example, in Siberia is defrosting. That's going to release tons of methane. And methane has 10 times greenhouse gas emissions than, say, CO2. And there are actually bacteria and viruses have been frozen in the tundra there in the permafrost for thousands of years. And some of them have been discovered recently. So there could be even freakier versions of pandemics coming out. And therefore, pandemics and global climate change go together and the cost of dealing with the next pandemic is going to be huge, whether we try to prevent it ex ante or whether we try to uh, damage, control it ex post, like we did with COVID-19. So we have to be getting used to the fact that pandemic are going to become more frequent, more virulent, more severe and more costly. And that's going They're to not take... an exception. Sorry, I was just going to say that that's going to take uh, a lot more cooperation as far as the world goes. And we're seeing such a divided world right now when it comes to the way China deals with things, the way the West deals with things, and geopolitics? Geopolitics prevents uh, cooperation because many of the mega threats that I talk about are global. Climate change is global. Pandemics are global. Financial instability is global. Economic crises are global. And global security is also global. But in a world of great powers that are having very different views about their own economic, political, and geopolitical system. China, uh, Russia, North Korea, and Iran on one side, US, Europe, and the West on the other side. This geopolitical depression prevents uh, cooperation on the key global issues. Like we didn't have any cooperation on the issue of COVID-19. Every country went their own way. Same thing on climate change. It's very hard to agree on stuff that implies cost in the short run and only benefits in the medium to long term. That's why in a world of great powers, essential on a collision course, global cooperation to provide global public goods becomes much harder to achieve.
and China is still battling the pandemic. But what sort of future role will China play on the global stage, do you think? Well, China is a rising power, but it's a power that uh, is referred to as a revisionist power, that together with allies, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and now even Pakistan, challenges the economic, social, political, trading, financial, monetary, and geopolitical order that the US, Europe, and the West created after World War II. Our systems are essentially one of liberal democracy, market economy with social welfare state, and projecting power globally, but in a friendly way. China is a political model that is authoritarian and become more authoritarian under Xi Jinping, an economic model that is strictly of state capitalism becoming more so, and geopolitical right now, China is flexing its muscles, want to take over Taiwan, wants to dominate hegemony in Asia and so on. And therefore, the West and China, unfortunately, are on a collision course on many dimensions. Will that so-called communist capitalism backfire at some stage? Well, this economic model has worked for China for a while, but until Xi Jinping became president, there was more economic liberalization, there was more even of uh, uh, freedoms, individual freedoms, even if China was not a democracy and not expected to become one. But in the last decade under Xi Jinping, the country has become inward, more authoritarian politically, has become more in the direction of state capitalism, state-owned enterprises, state-owned banks, local governments uh, spending on infrastructure rather than developing the private sector. If anything, they started to bash the private sector, uh, the tax sector, many other elements of the private sector. And geopolitically right now, China is becoming more flexing its own muscles uh, on global affairs in a way that is perceived as being aggressive by many of its neighbors. And China has a number of territorial issues uh, with India, with Vietnam, with Indonesia, with Malaysia, with the Philippines, with Japan, and so on. So those are dangerous things that are escalating, let alone the issue of Taiwan, where the goal of Xi Jinping is, of course, to be the president that uh, reunited the mainland with Taiwan. So there'll be tensions uh, with, mm -hmm. with China, and their economic model is fragile. Too much debt, too much real estate, too much uh, fixed investment and credit-fueled uh, infrastructure spending that is becoming excessive, not enough domestic consumption, and so on. And those uh, things imply that already the potential growth of China that used to grow 10% per year for many decades became only 5%. Most recently, China has been growing 2 or 3%, and I fear it's not just cyclical, that the potential growth of China may be only 2 or 3% over the medium long term. So it's a powerful country, but one that has a number of economic and financial fragilities as well. So do you think Germany made a, an economic and geopolitical mistake in letting China invest, say, in the key port of Hamburg? Well, the, that, I think, is, uh, is dangerous because uh, China makes this investment not for economic reasons, but for geopolitical reasons. But I think that the biggest risk is the economic dependence of Germany on one exports to China and to um, doing foreign direct investment in China. Uh, you know, Germany already made the mistake of being too dependent on a strategic rival like Russia for its energy needs. And now with the brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, there'll be a scramble to try to replace that energy with other sources energy prices are going to be higher, and therefore the economic model of German manufacturing was based on heavy manufacturing, was energy intensive with cheap energy from Russia. That model is broken. I worry that uh, Germany is now too dependent on China, either for exports or foreign direct investment, since we are on a collision course between the West and China on the geopolitical matters. Eventually, the kind of shock that occurred with Russia could also occur over time with China, and therefore that dependence of Germany on Chinese markets directly and indirectly could become another vulnerability for the German economy. 
What about the vulnerability of something like artificial intelligence? It's something that China's pushed to all new heights. Will AI be replacing more and more jobs in 2023 as far as uh, our vulnerability goes, white-collar jobs as well as uh, factory workers and all sorts of jobs? Well, it's going to take time. It's not a matter of only 2023, but it's clear that uh, AI, machine learning, robotic automation is leading first to displacement of routine jobs that are blue collar in manufacturing, then of more cognitive jobs that can be sliced in a number of tasks that can be automated. And those are white collar jobs. But now with uh, chat uh, GPT and similar kind of tools, even some of the creative jobs uh, can be also eventually gradually replaced by the machine. So these technological innovations increase the economic pie, but they also increase income and wealth inequality because there are capital intensive skill buyers and labor saving. So if you own the machines or the capital on the machine, you do well. If you're in the top 10% distribution of skills, education and human capital, probably the AI makes you more productive. But if you are a blue collar worker or white collar worker with low or medium value added industries, Increasingly, your jobs and your income is going to be challenged by AI, machine learning, robotic and automation. We're going to go in the direction of uh, effectively permanent, permanent technological unemployment because of AI. AI is also having geopolitical consequences. Today, the two powers that are investing the most in AI are the United States and China. In Europe, they have basic research but the applications are still very limited. And uh, this past year, uh, Henry Kissinger was the biggest geopolitical strategist of our time in the US. And uh, Eric Schmidt, who used to be the CEO of Google, wrote a book together on AI and pointing out that who is going to win the AI race between US and China not only is going to dominate all the industries of the future, but it's going to be also the global hegemonic military and security power, because increasingly warfare is going to also be based on AI, autonomous drones, robo-soldiers, and weaponized systems that are based on artificial intelligence. So even the future of warfare is based on AI. So who wins that race becomes also the dominant geopolitical power of our times. I think for Europe, uh, the best solution is to ally itself then with the United States. We have the same economic system, the same social and political system, the same geopolitical strategy. And of course, uh, Europe wants the US to maintain NATO and its support of NATO to, how to say, to manage and contain the Russia there. But the Americans are going to tell the European, first of all, you'll have to spend more on your own defense. Two, we need to have a shift and a pivot of NATO not only from challenging the Russian bear, but also the rising uh, nefarious influence of China in Asia. And therefore, that switch of NATO towards pivoting to Asia is going to be something that also the Europeans will have to accept and address as a compensation for the US supporting them in Europe with NATO. So, Mr. Rabini, huge technological and economic changes ahead of us. Um, a lot of doom and gloom, though. Is there anything positive that you can leave us with uh, to finish off the interview? Well, in the case of Europe, I think that the positive thing is that the European Union kept together, faced with the threat of Russia, actually, in spite of some of the division, there has been a common European policy. Secondly, the Eurozone, in spite of its problems, is moving in the direction of greater risk sharing. and. Uh, uh, there's also new members that are joining, like Croatia, in the future, other ones. And from a security point of view, I don't think that Europe is going to arrive to any independent uh, strategic autonomy the way Macron and France want it. But I think that now NATO is becoming stronger. Sweden and Norway joining is going to make NATO stronger. So at least in Europe, Eurozone, European Union and NATO are becoming more cohesive in a way that stabilizes the European continent, given the challenges that are coming, especially from Russia. That certainly is a positive. You heard it from world-famous economist Nouriel Roubini. Thanks for talking with us about the global economy.
great being with you today. And thank you for watching us here on DW Business. That's all for today. I'm Ben Fazulan. I hope you have a very good new year. 2023 has a lot in store for all of us. I'll see you again soon here on DW. Bye-bye.